way of describing what I'm doing is it's based on trends. It's based on the fact that Homo sapiens has been doing this for millions of years, and it's relatively easy to project the future from the past. Let me give you an example. Um, since I brought up gay marriage, just because it's been in the news, let's take 112 years of American history around who we have decided is a citizen or a colleague or allowed to be a student. Okay? Now, not all of you have been around all that time, but in 1900, in California, yeah, you could shoot people of Chinese descent. You could kill them and nobody minded. It was a huge group of Chinese that came over from uh, ports like Canton to work on the railroad. And they weren't, of course, seen as regular human beings. And so if you, they irritated you or whatever, and there was a $50 bounty on Native Americans. There's a reason why there are fewer Native Americans in California compared to virtually any other place in the United States, <laughs> because we, you killed them all, but not you. I understand that. Um, in fact, there is that wonderful book, Ishii, you know, the last um, Native American. I mean, he wasn't the last, but he certainly seemed to be. Uh, but in 1902, um, California said, no, we can't shoot Chinese people anymore. You have to think about it first. And in 1905, they took the bounty off Native Americans. In 1920, uh, across the United States, women got the vote. I, we may someday, you know, um, have a president. At uh, 1930s, working men said, we're going to organize. And it was the beginning of backing off of a 55-hour work week. Now, many have gone back to work 55 hours a week, but apparently it's voluntary now. All right? Um, uh, 1940s. Uh, was the uh, Native Americans got basic civil rights after World War II. A lot of, uh, it was really these wonderful cultural stories like the, the talkers, you know, the ability uh, of the Navajo to do the um, uh, special kind of uh, language uh, for intelligence services in World War II, it did, you know, or Jim <laughs> Thorpe, whatever way you want. It's, it's amazing what kind, how a story will take your gut and completely shift it. That's why culture is so powerful. Uh, so 1950s, Martin Luther King Jr. and the civil rights, uh, really a monumental shift. 1960s, of women equal pay for equal work. They're still arguing about that. 1970s, um, look at the trajectory now. Look at the direction. Look at how culture changes. OK, 1970, two things. Um, seniors, all of a sudden, you couldn't kill granny anymore. And they started talking about, you know, having regulations in nursing homes and things like that, and animals. Now, I was raised on a farm, and we always thought you had to take care of animals. It was an economic necessity. But now, animals, in this long sequence, because we've got 70 years now in the sequence I'm trying to show you, it was, it's more about life. Once your stomach is full, you start thinking about other things. And many kids in the 40s and 50s were still trying to eat. And that's still, of course, happening somewhat in the United States and certainly around the world. But in the 1970s, you started thinking about what we were eating. And then you got things like free-range chickens. You can go to Trader Joe's and you can buy naturally nested hen eggs with or without access to roosters. <laughs> <laughs> now, that means fertilized or not fertilized. I don't know if it means the chickens are happy or not. But think of the complexity of that idea. We vote now, state by state, on how big a pen we're going to allow for a pig. We vote state by state against veal, against you know, making geese or ducks or whoever eat more than they would like to eat. We vote on uh, uh, how we kill cat cattle. When we first came to the United States, my father, who had been a policeman in London, could not get a job, so he became a killer on the Florida Armour Star. And the way they killed then was the uh, cow came up a ramp, and a man with a sledgehammer was at the top of the ramp. And, you know, he was a very powerful man, and he prided himself on being able to, you know, do it humanely. <laughs> but we don't do that anymore, right? Uh, extraordinary changes in our view. It is a felony in the state of Washington where I live, a felony to drown a kitten. It's called the Posada Law, after some kids have beat up a donkey. Um, this is the, how powerful single stories are. So 
you can imagine the trajectory of this continuing concern about various human beings, but also various animals. It's not just dolphins anymore, dolphin free tuna. Why did dolphins get so much attention? Not because we think they might be sentient, they had a television show. <laughs> At the same time that Flipper was telling this new story about dolphins, Charlie, for those of you old enough to remember, the tuna wanted to be caught and cut up and put in a can. <laughs> he wanted to be good enough for Starkist. We have more endangered tuna species than we have endangered dolphin species. Right? The story, the cultural belief system is so powerful. All right, so 1980s, most of you are alive by now. Americans with Disabilities Act. Again, distance learning is a wonderful element in that. But who thought there was any need for curbs? Wide doors, you know, rails in the toilets. Who thought there was any need for all of that? I didn't. They had television. I thought they were happy at home. Think about it. I had a friend who was a quad, and we'd go downtown, and he would had a tube that we just put in the trees in downtown Seattle. Or if we needed to go up a curb, we recruited two or three guys, and we got the wheelchair over the curb. It wasn't until they were on I-5 blocking traffic in their wheelchairs that it occurred to me that something was wrong. And what was wrong is that it wasn't accessible. Now, there's still, I think they have too many parking places, don't you? And they're always empty. <laughs> That's gallows humor. You have to laugh about the absurdity of how cultural systems operate. All right, so we've got through the 80s. We're now in the 90s. Who in the 90s did we add to whose kind of normal citizenry that you're willing to, you know, eat with or work with or have in your classes or whatever? Who did we add in the 90s? Because California did it, so. San Francisco? We've already talked about it, gays. And since we've joked about don't ask, don't tell, I won't take it any further, but they've become legitimate. They're all over the place. Uh, isn't it wonderful? I mean, my, I mean, in high school, of course, we didn't even know about that stuff. But that's because I graduated in 1960. But I had a wedding, of, uh, I guess, three or four years ago, maybe five times, of um, two um, of my neighbors who were gay, Paul and Bill. And, and uh, Paul is a thoracic surgeon. And he'd been kicked out of the military in Iraq <laughs> because... He was, he, someone's got an email. I mean, he'd never done anything. He's very quiet. You'd think they needed thoracic surgeons in Iraq, wouldn't you? All right. But anyway, he and Paul wanted to get married, and I have a big garden, so they got married. And it was very interesting. There were all these people standing around, maybe about 40 people. And we were all watching the couple, and they were talking to each other. And at some point, it was like there was this ripple, like a sea change in all of us, and we understood what we were witnessing wasn't just some kind of new thing in America, but love. It was literally transforming. I'd been running around, you know, cleaning this, cleaning that, and making everything look nice. I didn't stop to think about what was going on, and I felt it. And the whole group changed. The symbol as well as the story. All right, so now we're at um, um, 2000. So 2000, I'll just save you the energy. I'll do the work this time, but I'm going to make you work later. Um, transgender. Now, I would have thought that would have been tough, but now if you're a faculty member here, as long as you time it right, you can be Stan in May and Susan in September. Teachers are doing it all over the place. I don't know what it is about teaching. The first group that I worked with were Boeing engineers. And they were 10 to 1 becoming women. Most gender identity switches are men becoming women. 10 to 1. And I know all this because uh, uh, when I was at the medical school, they recruited me for a thing called the Gender Identity Committee. They had only men on it. They had a urologist and a plastic surgeon and a this and that on it, and they had no women on it. That's because there were no women teaching in the medical school. I was the first woman teaching core courses in the University of Washington Medical School. That's how old I am. <laughs> so they said, oh, we've got a woman, and we're making all these women. 
we're switching all these men into women, and there are no women on our committee. <laughs> and of course, the transgendered people had figured that out, so they were coming in, in totally stereotypical lace outfits, you know, because you have to cross-dress for two full years before the committee will consider you. But what was interesting was the number of Boeing engineers. And um, so finally, Boeing called me in, and they said, we don't know what to do. Because you said they have to cross-dress, but they're still men, and we only have male bathrooms and female bathrooms. We have no middle-of-the-road bathrooms here. <laughs> and what, what should we do? Well, what have hospitals done about that? Everybody uses the same bathroom. But that is terrifying to some people, absolutely terrifying. I mean, women don't want to see urinals. It turns out men don't like urinals that much anymore. <laughs> um, most people would just soon have a door. But unisex is a really scary thing. But women on a regular basis now get tired of lines and they go into men's bathrooms. So give it up. It's almost over.